2 Peter chapter 3. We will be, I'm planning on, would like to take our videos and audio of all the history since we're almost done with the Bible and put that on an app. They have church apps, they also have ministry apps. And what that would do is if you have a droid or uh, an Android or also an um, um, Apple, I guess it would be, uh, you can um, download that app with either one. And, and what happens is as soon as you push on it, it just opens everything. You can scroll through all of our stuff. It makes them that much more accessible than trying to feed through and get a download and all of that. And uh, then we can also put Bibles on there, we can put study helps on there, just so many other things, and it can just be really simple. Some of you, how many of you are, you know, um, technically challenged and you don't even have a smartphone? Okay. Good, but if you have a smartphone, you got apps, so you're already crossing that divide, good. So I think it's time to keep moving forward, and I think that's going to be the future for that and uh, it also just makes it so easy you just pop open your app and you have it all right there all right second peter chapter 3 verse 1 dear friends i think that was the heart of peter toward the body of christ so many friends out there all over the known world this is now my second letter to you and I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. Let me pray quickly. Father, thank you again for your word. Um, the final words of Peter. Um, written down, Lord, for us, for the body of Christ throughout all the history of the church and also the world here. Thank you for this revelation, Lord. and. Uh, give us uh, eyes to see what, what his heart was expressing through your heart tonight. And uh, we're just so thankful to have this truth. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's a reminder. Peter's big on reminders. In fact, he tells us here, this is now my second letter to you because we've gone through 1 Peter and now 2 Peter. I have written both of them. And he tells us what he wrote them for. They both have a common purpose. Peter didn't just want to be a prolific writer and put out a bunch of stuff. He's directed by the Lord, but he did it as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. What's good about reminders? What kind of a reminder? If you, if you back up there to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12... He, he's already shared this in this letter, but he explains why he reminds. And he says, so I, I, always, I will always remind you of these things. And that is, that, and that's what he's going to do in this chapter. I'm going to remind you um, that as a believer, what's coming? I'm going to always be reminding you that you're going to stand before the Lord one day. Because you need to be reminded of that. And, and that there's judgment coming upon this earth. And those things are as sure as your relationship with the Lord is today, is that there's a promise of His return. And that day is coming soon. Because, you know, that expectancy as a, for us as believers that the Lord could come any day changes our lives greatly. He says, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth, you know, you now have, which means you already know them. I've already told you them, but it's a mission of mine to keep reminding you of them. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. Now he says that because we're not always going to have this tent, this body. We're going to get a new body, a glorified body, but this body's dying. And it's a reminder to him that I don't have that much long, longer in this body and you really don't have that much longer either. So I'm going to leave this body. He says, because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus has made clear to me. He made a special reference to Peter in his death when, before he left the earth. And he says, I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. He was filled with the glory of the Lord. 
and he, and he explains that. He saw the Lord in his glory. Yeah. Uh, Paul had a special revelation of the Lord as well. The Lord stood by him. And John, as we're going to see here, this writer, uh, John, uh, not only in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, but also in the book of Revelation, these last books, he also saw the Lord in glory. But Peter, James, and John were there and when they saw the Lord on the Mount of Transfiguration. Once you see that, your eyes are forever changed in who Jesus is. He's not just a man who went to a cross, meek and humble, and giving his life as a suffering servant. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. And our eyes need to be filled and reminded that that's who he is. He's at the right hand of the Father and he's getting ready to judge the entire earth. And that's the next step. So Peter wants us to be reminded of that. To stimulate you. And that just means to wake up somebody from sleep. I think we go to sleep and it, he's implying that even though we know these truths, we've been told these truths, um, <laughs> If you're not reminded and it's not a current, that's why a daily devotional time and time with the Lord, it reminds you, man, what I'm doing today, what this day is all about. But if we drift off and drift away, we kind of go to sleep, which means we're not alert and we're not impassioned, if you will, for the world around us. And you know what it's like. We tend to want to withdraw. And, uh, but the Lord says... Uh, Peter is saying, we want you to be awakened, stimulated, to what? To wholesome thinking. Wholesome thinking. What does that really mean? Wholesome uh, means pure or clear thinking. I just, I just, just, just a reminder. And I say this just about, seems like, uh, every week. But nobody else tells us these things. You can't find it anywhere in the world what these pages reveal. It is God's direct line to truth. There's nothing like it. It, it is pure. It is exactly what our eyes, our ears, our minds, our hearts, our souls should be locked onto. Everything else, the message of the world, is a lie. And it's only when we listen to this that we get truth. And we need truth. There's a clarity that comes. I, when I think of this passage or I think of this word here, I think of thinking clear. I don't know if any of you watched that documentary on Scientology. Well, that's, that was, that's the goal for L. Ron Hubbard. He promised that if you, you know, go through his series of teachings, he will clear you. You'll get a, reach a place of being clear it's as if you you've tapped into all of this knowledge and now you see it for its full you know in its full reality and uh, there's that excitement of somebody saying man I'm gonna my the my mind because it's obviously kind of a uh, uh, disregard of the body for the uh, Scientology but now you have reached this mental state that you tap into the knowledge of the universe and uh, that's pretty that's a pretty good drawing card isn't it to promise that. Um, it says Scientology is a religion that contains tools and methods to assist you in finding answers to life's questions. Your own truth about your life and you. But it's, but it's deceiving because it's not. It's not truth. It's not going to bring you clarity. It's going to bring, bring you more confusion than you've ever had. But they can't deliver it. But God delivers, doesn't he? The word of God is the truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. God has the way to make us mentally clear. And that's what he's saying here. Keep your mind clear. And one of the things that clears our mind more than anything is knowing why we're here, where we're going, and what's coming ahead. And God has made it really clear what's coming I live in this world like we just spoke about, even in, at, at Thanksgiving time. I don't need to get bogged down in, you did this to me, you did that to me, I don't like you, I don't like you. Life's bigger than that. If you don't like me, fine. I love you, and I'm going to pray for you. 
even no matter what you've done to me, I can let that go because it's bigger than that. Because there's an eternity that's uh, in the balance here. And if you're somebody who doesn't know the Lord, you're perishing. And judgment is coming to you from God, the God of heaven. I look at things different, and we should. And we got to keep on that track, don't we? So we don't get bogged down into all those things. And we're overwhelmed by them. So, verse 2, he says, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. He's going to say, listen, God's written down the words that tell you all the information you need to stay clear, to stay focused. It's written down in His Word. We don't have to find some you know, way that we can tap into God and get this revelation. If I just knew, God, what, what it's all about, could you just come speak to me and give me this great revelation? No, I don't have to do that. It's right here. He's given it. So He's directing us back to that. So in the past, in, in, in Acts uh, chapter 3, 21, Peter writes, or he says, he's quoted by Luke, he says, he must remain in heaven, speaking of Jesus, until the time comes for God to restore everything. And that's what he's talking about tonight. The time's coming. As he promised long ago through his holy prophets. So he's making reference that Jesus, when Jesus comes, He's going to be the ruler of the earth. The Messiah is going to be Lord and King. All the nations will bow down. And the Old Testament is very clear. It's written down. Now, we can get thrown off a little bit because Jesus didn't do that at his first coming. But Peter's saying, wait a minute. But that, that, was, that was just, a, just uh, uh, the beginning. Setting in place all the things that are needed to come into relationship with him. But but he's not finished. He's returning again. He's coming back again. So uh, the uh, present apostles, Peter as well, are revealing these things. And uh, these are things that we know. And um, the Lord helps us with that. So we know what's coming. And uh, it's awesome, isn't it, what's coming? When you think about what's coming to this planet and also to us when we go to be with the Lord, it's pretty awesome. It's pretty overwhelming. He just talked about the beam of judgment, the judgment seat of Christ. That was the last chapters that, uh, of chapter 1. He's saying, listen, we're going to be judged. What it, what's it going to be like when we're standing in that judgment? We can either go into this judgment, uh, you know, which we know we're going to stand before the Lord, be, be accountable for all the things that we've done, not for our sin, not to pay for our sin because he's paid for it, but to be accountable. And he's saying, listen, you can go in poorly or you can go in with victory, and it's, it's your choice what kind of life you want to live, but he wants us to live that victorious life, so we charge in, and we're excited there of saying, Lord, I was thankful to be able to give my life uh, away to you. Peter is building the excitement about not only being in heaven and all the things that are to come, but he's building a case to say, what kind of life then ought we to live? And why are we going to waste it on anything else but doing what the Lord's got us to do the purpose that we're here. So, um, we see clearly, um, people might wonder, I, know, I think the world wonders what's going to happen in the future. They got a sense that something's going to happen. World War III, right? People are always thinking about that. Asteroids hitting us. It's kind of cloudy. Aliens taking over. The world doesn't know, but we know exactly what's going to happen and the way it's going to happen. So he says, first of all, verse 3, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come. Scoffing, because that's what scoffers do. <laughs> they scoff. And following their own evil desires, they will say, where is this coming, he prophesied. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it is since the beginning of creation. Peter says here, this is of first importance that we understand here. You must understand the scoffer and that they're going to be coming. What's a scoffer? A mocker? Has he been talking about him? Yeah, he has, because this is the same reference to a false teacher. What does a false teacher really ultimately do? He leads you away from Christ. But one of the key things that false teachers do is they they either get you focused on you and your 
uh, prosperity and your, uh, your life here on earth and they also take you away from setting your life aside and they, they make the, your life the focus, right? So now they, they shift that uh, gear there and they also do this. They also get uh, the church to say, well, you know, I don't think that judgment's really coming. Or it's not going to be quite like that because I don't think God's really going to judge because you know what? He's a God of love. And so they get you away into your flesh and then they get you to, to, to be sleeping in the sense of thinking you're not, you're not awake. You're forgetting, right? That this is really going to come. Judgment really is going to come. And that's what false teachers do. He said it in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. He, this last chapter, he says, For they mouth empty boastful words, and by appealing to the lust, uh, lustful desires, verse 18, of sinful human nature, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. That's their idea is to pull us away from Christ. Now that's exactly what the church today is doing. Do we have scoffers in the church? I shared with you last week, you know, Peter ends. There's a guy who was in an evangelical seminary as a professor obviously gone through seminary, gone through all the training, and then now he walks away from that and he goes into liberalism and he begins to cast doubt on God's word. Well, maybe, you know, it doesn't really mean that or we can't really trust what God's word says. So he writes this book kind of in mockery uh, that, yes, um, uh, for the Bible tells me so. And he kind of mocks that, that you know, the Bible really doesn't tell us all we need to know, or we really can't trust what the Bible tells us. Thank you. I'm so glad you're a pastor, right? I'm so glad you're a teacher. I mean, they should burn some of these institutions down. I mean, I don't mean that literally, in a terroristic kind of <laughs> recording everything. Burn them all down. But, you know, in God's eyes, it's useless because it's leading people away from there. And, and, and they're numbing people away from the, the reality that there really is a judgment that's coming. And, but they make a mockery of that. And that's what the church is doing. Here's what the church is doing worldwide. The, what we're seeing uh, amongst, in the church, a movement that's saying, hey, revival's coming. Prosperity is going to come within the church. Uh, a unity is happening within the body of Christ and you know the body of Christ is unifying and we're going to be, be, be welcoming the world into love and peace because that's the church's goal is to bring peace to the earth. No, it's not. Read your Bible. It isn't going to go down that way. He, the Bible says it's going to wax worse and worse. I, I, we would love for to see that happen but it won't happen that way. The Lord's going to have to intervene and judge the earth because of its wickedness. It's going to get worse and worse. But what is the church doing? Oh, it's, it's going to be good. It'll be all good. It's all going to get better and better. You've got a social justice movement, right, that's focused instead of on bringing people out of darkness and s escaping hell um, and the judgment that's coming, and they don't warn people anymore. Um, instead of doing that, they... Um, put all kinds of programs together to, to make sure we can clean the air. You know, give everybody fresh water. That's, that's the primary focus of the church. No, it's not the primary focus of the church. I'm not against clean air. I'm not against clean water. Any of that. I'm not against us having healthy bodies and overcoming disease, but that's not our mission. Because the bodies are perishing. And as we're going to see tonight, there's a reason why the earth system is collapsing because it's on its way to utter collapse. And you know who's going to collapse it? God's going to collapse it. He's not building the earth into a pure state and the physical earth. And, and he's not, he's not, that's not even his concern right now. He's allowing it to be judged and he'll ultimately judge it. It's going to get worse and worse there as well. That's not our focus. But that's the church's focus. The ecumenical movement's not sounding the alarm to warn people of a pending judgment. You will stand before God. You need to turn your life to God. But they're making plans to stay here forever. To make this the church place that will dwell forever. It isn't our home. 
Heaven's our home. We're not reaching out to, to again, build. Uh, we want the kingdom of God to come in, but that only comes not by compromising the truth, but it's telling the truth and, uh, and, 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 and preaching the gospel. And that's what the Lord's called us to do in the last days. So, what are, what are the last days? Quickly. What does that mean, this word, uh, word uh, phrase, last days? They're, they're literally the day from, um, from the day that Jesus went up into heaven and the angels promised his return. We've been expecting his return again. The next day that's coming is the Lord's day. So, we're looking for a new day. But the new day is the Lord's day. The Lord, in the last days here, we're seeing that these days are numbered, but there's going to be a day that's called the day of the Lord, and I'll explain more about that in just a minute. He says, but they deliberately, verse 5, forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. What is that? That's the flood. But here's what these teachers do. They deliberately forget. What are they supposed to do? Remember? Just like Peter wanted us to do. Remember what's promised by the prophets of old and today. There's judgment coming. And that judgment includes fire. What happened in the last time that God declared a worldwide judgment? It was the flood. And he, and he told Noah to build an ark. And Noah preached to the people of his day, the Bible says, but they disregarded it. Why? Because they had false teachers, didn't they? People saying, you know what? God's not going to judge. It. He's not, that's not going to happen. He's not going to judge this whole earth. Yeah, he is. And he did. And so he's reminding us of that. Jesus said this, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. We're on the precipice of another day. He's promised it, but what's happened is it's, it's so far back that it was promised that even in the church today, we're having scoffers that are coming and going, oh, it's, you know, like how long has it been? It's not coming now. We've been saying that for forever. It's never happened. Oh, wait a minute. Peter's going to build a case here of saying that, that doesn't mean anything because it's taken a long time. But Jesus said, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage up to the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what happened until the flood came and took them away. They knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them away. You mean they didn't know there was a flood coming? No, that's not what it's saying. They knew very well what was coming. They just didn't believe it was coming. So they lived in a place of sleeping, didn't they? It's not going to come. But God said it was going to come. So they were in denial, weren't they? Just like these men. They put us in a place of denial. The world mocks God. Man thinks he's great. I mean, please. If you've gotten to that point, you've lost your mind. You're not God. You don't run the universe. God does. And He's powerful and He's awesome. And if He wants to, He puts His finger down. You don't exist anymore, right? You're dead. You stand before Him. He's awesome and powerful. But they, they get this idea that now you can stay to Him. You're going to mock Him. And you're going to mock that... that that he says he's ruler and that there will be a judgment one day, well, that's what's happening when these false teachers preach. They're getting people to, to act like they're going to stand in judgment. Some of these preachers today, they, they say things, and you're thinking, okay, they're saying there's no hell. They're saying that there's, you, you, you don't need to come to Jesus. You can come through any uh, system. We're all God inside. God dwells in all. No, he doesn't. That's why I need to come to Jesus, because I'm perishing. I'm lost. I'm, God isn't in me. <laughs> but when I receive Christ, then God comes into me, and, my, and, and life begins. But they're acting like, no, we're all God's children, and everything is good. No, it's not. So they're wrong. 
And so they knew nothing until they were all taken away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. And Jesus said, listen, before I come, that's the way the world's going to be. And that's kind of the way the world is right now, right? It just seems really arrogant. You don't see humility, not from leadership, not from nations. It's like, we're going to solve this. We're going to do this. Man's on, we're on the precipice of the greatest time ever. Come on. Be real. And God says, we make a real assessment where we really are. Uh, we're not very well at all until we uh, turn our hearts back to the Lord. And, uh, but that day is coming. This is how it will be at Jesus' coming. By, uh, verse 7. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. So, just like he said he was going to do this with water, this time he says he's going to do it with fire. Last time, after he did it with water, he said, I'm never going to do that <laughs> with water again. Never going to flood the earth again. Rainbow's a reminder of that. But that doesn't mean there won't be a final judgment, and it's going to be a fiery judgment. Now, let me ask you this question. If water meant water, does fire mean fire? Just, just checking. Because some people say, well, that's symbolic. And, and no. No, it's literal. Because he's going to describe how he's going to do it. And it's literal. There's a fire that's coming, a judgment. It's going to consume. And uh, again, even when he, when he puts our works to the test, he puts them to the test by fire there in that sense. And, and in that spiritual sense. And then the physical realm, he's going to do it with literal, real fire. Should we believe him at his word then? If, if he did it the first time, will he do it the second time? Should we really think that he's going to do it this time? Or should we think, ah, he's probably not going to do it? Well, that's to fall into the same trap, isn't it? Jude, and he lived at the same time as the flood. He was the seventh from um, um, Adam. And he prophesied this. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy angels to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of the ungodly acts. Think about him. He's living as a righteous man at the most wicked time that the earth had known. All men were doing whatever was evil continually. And here's Enoch walking with God. And what, what comes onto his heart? What's the revelation that comes to his heart in the middle of a wicked generation? God says to him, I'm going to judge it. I won't let this go forever. And he's not even referring to the first judgment that's of water. He's referring to the second judgment. That's the judgment we're waiting on. And he says, in all the harsh words, uh, ungodly sinners have spoken against him. He's going uh, to judge. And we'll see that in a couple of books, the book of Jude. Verse 8, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. Again, but do not forget. Well, why do I need to remember that? Why, 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 why is that something I need to remember? That, oh, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like, what does that even mean? Right? Well, let me, let me see if I can explain this, because it doesn't mean what some people make it out to mean, that, you know, the Lord created the earth in a thousand, you know, six thousand years instead of six days. That's not what it's referring to. Here's what it means. Um, I believe it means a thousand years are like a day. So what does that mean? I'm going to use the second part of this. A thousand years are like a day. Even though a thousand years go by from the time he promises to bring a judgment, to him it's only as if a day has gone by. In what way? It meaning he has not forgotten his promise so they're saying, hey, look how long it's been. It's been, now it's been 2,000 years since his first, uh, uh, he left this earth and, and promised to return. He's not coming back, they would say. Here's what Peter's saying. It's only been a couple days. To the Lord, that isn't so much time that he's forgotten what he's promised. It, it, just because time's elapsed doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It's fresh in his mind, everything that he's promised. Well, what's the opposite mean? A day is like a thousand years. Well, the opposite is true for God. If he wants to wait a thousand years, or even two thousand years before he brings his judgment, he can wait. 
it's only a day or two to him. Meaning this, um, he's okay to make a judgment and not feel that he has to fulfill it the next day. He can make a judgment, declare it there, and he's patient, isn't he? I'll take time. I got a timing on this, and I can... I got, I got time to wait until this all comes into place. God is very patient in all of the things that He promises. He, he uh, isn't worried about time going by here. He's, he's okay with that. And that's what's happened. Time has gone by. But the question is, why would He wait so long? That's what we, we ask. Why are you waiting so long? When we were talking about the prophets, false prophets... You get so mad at what false prophets are doing, Peter's even saying the blackest hell is reserved for them. Well, why doesn't God just kill them all now? Why do you even let them exist? Because he's long-suffering, right? He's patient, isn't he? They, they couldn't even, teachers can't even explain, these false teachers, why God, because in their mind, that why he's waited so long. If he was going to judge, he would have already done it, because look how wicked this world is. But God just keeps waiting, doesn't he? In Daniel chapter 9, he, he gives this thing of 70 weeks of prophecy. And 70 weeks, that's 70 groups of seven. It was to be 69 sevens, he said, until God sent his son to the earth. So he told him way out there. That's a long time, 483 years from the time that the decree went forth to rebuild the wall. And he waited that 483 years before he sent his son. The Bible says in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Galatians 4.4. 4. God had a time. He said it way out ahead of time. But you know what? That's nothing because he already spoke to, uh, to Abraham 1,500 years prior to that, which means 2,000 years. He told him, he promised him what was going to be coming through his seed through his descendants. And it took 2,000 years for that to unfold to the promise there. But it did come, didn't it? 2,000 years later, Jesus came and he died on the cross. But that se final 70th seven still hasn't happened. He says, and Daniel says, listen, the Messiah will be cut off but it says now that there's going to be a time when the prince will come. He'll sign a seven-year treaty. The prince of the people, a revived Roman Empire. And that's going to come and there's going to be a seven-year treaty. And that's going to be that final seven, which is the return of the Lord. That's pretty uh, uh, incredible, but it hasn't happened yet. So there's a 2000, another 2,000-year gap from the first coming now, just about 2,000 to now but you know what it doesn't mean he's not coming it means he's been patient been very patient hasn't he he's he the scoffers are wrong peter says in verse 9 the lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness he is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance now let's look at that really quickly I mean, uh, closely, excuse me. Very important verse. One of those ones you should know, you should have it memorized, mark it down in your Bible. Because people say, why doesn't God judge? Why does God let evil go on? God must not have power over evil, because if he would have, he would have judged evil. This is the answer right here. Why doesn't he? Why did he wait 2,000 years it says, he is not slow, but patient with you, which means with us, right? And with both of us, with me and with you, and even the false teachers, calling them, continuing to call them to repentance. He lets them live their life, doesn't he? And he doesn't just kill them as soon as they, they turn against him. Now, I want you to write this down, and I want you to... to Never let anybody tell you that this verse says anything different than what it says. Number one, God does not want anyone to perish. He's been very patient because He doesn't want anyone to perish. His heart is that I don't want one person to perish. If anybody tells you anything else about God, that is wrong. He does not want anyone 
to perish. Number two, God does God wants everyone to come to repentance. Not some, not only the chosen or the elect. Jesus died for everyone. Because why? Because he loves everyone. He loved the world. The world he will judge, the world he will um, eventually uh, burn up. He loves the people here. That's why he's been so patient. He's willing to be patient with all because he wants all to come to him. Now, what other purpose could Peter possibly have for saying the same thing twice? He said the same thing twice, just said it two different ways. Both mean the same thing, don't they? If God does not want any to perish then that means he must want everyone to come to repentance because there's no middle ground. The only way you cannot perish is that you would come to repentance. So he says it both ways. Why? He doesn't want anybody to, to wonder why God is waiting so long. Aren't you glad he waited a little longer for you? Man. Even when he comes in judgment, it's still going to be tapered off because he's going to come in a rapture and that ought to tell you it's time to repent. It gives you another chance to repent if you're still here. And you're going to give seven years, right? And you're going to see the hand of God and the world's going to see the darkest day ever. Know that God is the one putting that on there. And he's going to be calling to repent. And he's given 144,000 witnesses to go out and they're going to tell people to repent. And then um, he's going to use witnesses as well, the two witnesses with their miraculous things, and they're going to tell people to repent. And then after that, after all that's exhausted and the Antichrist begins to rise up, he's going to send angels that are going to fly over and call out to people verbally and tell men to relent. Do not take the mark of the beast. Turn to the Lord. Do you think he really cares? Yes, he cares. And then after that, all those that go in, there's going to be a time, a thousand years, the Bible says he'll rule and reign. It'll be a time of peace on the earth. But all those who, who are born in that age, who have not had a chance to accept or reject, at the end he's going to give them a chance. He's going to release Satan again. Let him say, well, who do you want to serve? And God's going to, everyone, he gives that opportunity. He wants that, that chance. That's the heart of God. I'm, thank, I'm thankful for that. I like what Ezekiel 33 says, verse 11. Say to them, this is God's heart toward Israel. He says, as surely as I live. Oh, God's alive, isn't he? As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Judgment's coming, but there's no pleasure in it. But rather that they would turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. While you, uh, why will you die, O house of Israel? What's his heart? Very clear what his heart is. He calls the same thing and says the same thing to us, right? But the day of the Lord, verse 10, will come like a thief. It's coming. As surely as it was prophesied, it is coming. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. He's telling us, this is exactly how it's going down. It's exactly how it's going down. Now let me explain something because it can be a little bit confusing. What is the day of the Lord? Well, Peter's been using this analogy, hasn't he? A thousand years are like a day. The day of the Lord is a thousand years long. A little more. It's a thousand and seven years. <laughs> Okay? When he takes over this earth, there's a clock that's ticking down. It's going to start with a rapture, the, the day of the Lord begins. Then after the rapture, the Bible says that 70th seven will come that's going to wrap up all of the prophecy regarding Israel to fulfill their kingdom, to establish their kingdom, and to send us into the millennial kingdom. That's seven years of tribulation. It's coming. Daniel prophesied it's been a long time, but it's coming. And that seven years is still on the horizon there. But that's the day of the Lord as well. In fact, that's all of what the Old Testament says about the day of the Lord. It speaks of that seven years. And it's terrible and it's horrible. And it's 
rotten. It's the worst time. Jesus said there's never going to be a day, time like it, and there never will be one uh, again after that. We've never seen anything like it. And so it's worse than anything that's ever happened before. But then there's a thousand year reign of Christ. And what he is saying here is, he's saying, listen, at the end of the day of the Lord, okay, it's going to come on us like a thief. It's going to begin and be launched on her. He's going to be in control and everything's going to roll from there. But at the end of that, what's going to happen? At the end of the thousand year reign of Christ, the Bible says this, he's going to um, bring and finish the judgment. Let me just read this really quickly and see if you can follow with me. <clears throat> Again, the day includes the judgment of his bride. This is what's going to happen during the day. The judgment of his bride, the beam of judgment. Peter's already told us that. We're going to be judged. It's an awesome day. Then there's going to be the judgment upon the nations of the earth, the tribulation. It's going to judge the whole earth, bring it to its knees. All the nations will bow down. Then there's the judgment upon those uh, who make it to the end, the Gentiles and the Jews, because they're going to be a people on this earth that are going to survive that tribulation. He's going to judge them, judge the Gentile nations, judge the Jewish nations, and uh, the rest, all the wicked will be put to death. And then those that uh, survive, survive that judgment will go into the thousand year reign. Then he's going to have the judgment of the, those who rebel at the end of the age. That's another judgment that's going to come. That's when Satan is released again and those who rebel, there will be a judgment there. And then in the last, at the end, um, he's going to have this final judgment here, which is called the great white throne judgment. And he's going to call up all the wicked dead from all time, from beginning to end, and they're all going to stand in that great white throne judgment, and all of them will be put in the lake of fire. As with the judgment of the angels and of Satan and of death, all of that's going to be put away. And at the end, everything's going to explode. That's what it's saying here. Everything will explode. Everything is going to be, uh, the, which means all of the universe, all of the stars out there, and the heavens and the earth, um, it says are going to be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything in it will be laid bare. It's coming. That's what's going to ultimately be the end of the day of the Lord. He's going to just burn it all. Well, I don't know exactly how he's going to do that, but one of the ways I think he's going to do it is the Bible says he created everything and it's all made for him and he is ruler over everything and he's before all things and it says in him all things are held together. Now, I'm not a scientist, so I don't understand all of the call of the mystery of energy, but I know that uh, atomic energy is pretty awesome and uh, atomic energy is really nuclear energy, right? When it's um, uh, um, allowed to, uh, uh, when they can cause that reaction to happen. So nuclear explosions happen when a nuclear reaction causes the uh, atomic energy to generate intense explosive heat. That's what happens. So what if God let go of all of that? Or what if he reacted basically all the atomic energy at the same time? What would be left? Nothing. Intense, amazing heat. And we talk about what holds all of the universe together. Can you imagine if all those boundaries were let go? What would happen in that? It's explosive. Don't understand it all, but that's what's going to happen. So he says in verse 11, since everything will be destroyed in this way, well then... What about little old you and me? What about our little life? Our little brief span on earth? Our three score and ten? It's a pretty good question, isn't it? What kind of people ought you to be? Since you know that, answer in the back. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's a good idea to be Christ-like. It says you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. It really kind of strips away all excuses to live any other kind of life, doesn't it? There's not an excuse to live any other kind of life. If you knew what was coming and you knew that that was coming, expecting it to come tomorrow, today, 
if we lived with that reminder that it's coming and it's coming soon, and that's what the church is supposed to have been doing all the days because we don't know when the last day is, uh, but we know it's coming, then there would be a sense of urgency every day, wouldn't there? We can live with that kind of sense of urgency, but it takes remembering, doesn't it? That's what we're doing tonight. We're remembering what, what's going to happen, what life's all about, what, what's uh, going to lie ahead. It is pretty awesome, and uh, things are going to be destroyed. So he says, that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. So he explains it, or gives more explanation. Of the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heavens and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Okay? Now, let me explain something else to you, because it will help you a little bit. Because the world is really, uh, the the world is consumed uh, with saving the world. But the world's not going to be saved. It's not going to happen. It's going to be destroyed. And who's going to destroy it? God's going to destroy it. So, if you're a tree hugger, all the trees are going to be burned down by the Lord. Just think about that for a minute. They're all going to be burned down. All of them. So, you're barking up the wrong tree. You're thinking of it wrongly. Because ultimately, it isn't about the trees because they're all going down. If you're a green person, you have, you're full of green hope for the planet and the seas and all of the things there of this earth, it's, it's not going to be green. It's going to be black. You need to be black. You need to, you need to go black. Go black. That means in your mind knowing it's all going black, Let's, let's call people to turn to the Lord, right? That's what I need to be doing because it's all going black. I can't spend my life trying to fix the, the seas. Uh, you know, there, I'm not saying you couldn't have a job that is environmental or there's any bad things about trying to do good things, but that's not our focus, is it? And that's not the Lord's focus. He never called the church to be focused on that. But that's where the church is now. They're doing all these social justice things. Great. But ultimately, whatever we do, we do to call men to Christ. That's our, that's our goal. Why? Because we know what's coming. Uh, so it'll change our heart a little bit. If you're a Mother Earth pe- person, obviously you shouldn't be as a Christian because there is no Mother Earth. Uh, Earth's going to burn to a crisp and uh, that'll be it for mom or pop or whoever the Earth uh, you want to say the Earth is. It was created by God and He's going to destroy it. So, if you want the earth to be beautiful forever, what do you need to do? Don't put your efforts into this one because this one's never going to be that. It's not going to be ultimately beautiful. This earth is doomed. It's cursed. Uh, people, you know, I, I tried to explain that when I did a debate and, and there was all these religions and they all wanted us to tell them what does your religion believe about the earth and, and preserving the earth and, and the environment. And so... I went into the debate, and then halfway through, I just said, listen, um, um, I don't think that uh, the earth's savable. In fact, it's cursed, and the one who cursed it was God, and ultimately, he's going to destroy the whole thing. I said, you know why? Because it, it doesn't have to do with the earth, ultimately. The earth is cursed because man is rebellious against God. You want to save the earth? Call men to repent, because it's through that, that the kingdom is coming. And uh, that's the goal there if you really want to be a preservationist and you want to save the earth. Because you won't save this one, but if you want to hasten the day for the next one, that's all that we can do, right? So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. How much effort? Every effort. Did Peter believe it? Yeah, he did. Why? Obviously, he saw the Lord. He knew the promises were true. He knew uh, what's coming. It was in his bones. He, he said, I want to keep telling you as long as I live, and I want to, you to be told even after I live. So he left us this book, and here we've come along 2,000 years later, and he's telling us, hey, listen, guys, it isn't about this life here. Uh, this life is fading away, but it's, there's a judgment that's coming, and you need to warn 
uh, uh, those around you and you need to be prepared and live the life, make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with him because you're going to stand before him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters. Obviously the spirit of God is true through Paul, through Peter, whoever. But it's the same revelation. Paul's calling for the same thing. He's the one who talked about the beam of judgment Paul did in Corinthians as well. And uh, their messages are the same. Um, he knows what's coming. He's giving this revelation. And Peter now is saying, listen, you need to listen to Paul. What he's saying is from God. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. I'm not the only one uh, proclaiming this. Paul is also proclaiming this. So what's he doing First of all, let me note this. Some people think that you know, Peter and Paul didn't get along. Now the Bible says that Paul rebuked Peter. And Paul rebuked Peter for what he's going to say next in the next line. He's given a reference to it because he goes down and he says, his later letters contain some things that are hard to understand. It's hard for me. What? Meaning that, hey, listen, there's no barrier between the Jew and the Gentiles now. The Gentiles are welcomed in. The barrier came down and now they're welcomed in. They get all the promises that we got. That's hard for a Jew. Also this, they're just as righteous as we are because their righteousness is from Christ. It's the same righteousness that you have and you didn't earn any of your righteousness. And, uh, and these dietary laws and all these things, they're, they're not a part of what God's doing now. Now you can have fellowship together and you can eat with one another. That was really hard. Those are hard things. But also... Paul talked about the rapture and different things that were, again, wow, okay, this is, this is some, deep, some deep stuff. So, um, which ignorant and unstable people distort, which means a lot of the Judaizers were distorting this. They were calling people back to these legalism. Paul says, no, we can't be saved through the law. We can't go back to those uh, and fulfill that by keeping the Sabbaths and, uh, in that way and festival rules and the new moons and all those things. Uh, now we just need to be uh, in a personal relationship with the Lord. So he says, as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men. That's what we should be uh, attentive to. Are we staying sharp? Our flesh want, would uh, like to believe that, you know, there really isn't going to be a judgment coming. And, and you know, in the end, there re he really won't judge. No, he loves the wicked, but he really will judge the wicked because he's a righteous God. Heaven isn't going to be a mixture of hell and heaven. It's going to be heaven because of the righteousness of the Lord. And anyone who's in rebellion against God will not be in heaven with him. And even though he wants them to be there, you're, the only way they're going to get there is to climb over the death of Christ for them. He's calling to them, turn. And that's our message, isn't it? To turn. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, that's what we're doing tonight. We're growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So what's the singular focus? How do I make it simple? I get my eyes on Jesus. Who is he? He's Lord, he's King. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's getting ready to stand up. It's getting ready to happen. I believe it's very close. I think we're at the end of the second day and I think it's close. All the signs of the times, everything's rolling forward. The earth is in, that, in the position. I'm looking at Israel, seeing all the nations uh, rage around them. Anybody want to go to Israel with us? It's going to be great. No, no place on the planet like it. But he's going to fulfill all of his promises. As I see those things coming, I see he's got this plan here and it's all unfolding and that's the greatest place to be on the earth and to be there and to be reminded as you stand on the temple mount and you think about uh, the word of the Lord as Jesus said he said um, you will not see me again Israel 
until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The next time you see me, you'll be calling out to me as your Savior, as a nation, and you'll see me return. It's exciting. And I want you to remember here, it says in Luke, watch therefore and pray that you uh, may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And we do that by receiving Christ so we won't have to stand in that judgment um, and or face the wrath that, that, um, of God. It says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, even if we die before His coming, we may live together with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Let me close this in prayer tonight. Father, we do thank you for this great chapter. It's an awesome chapter. It tells us a lot about what's happening on the news uh, every, every night. Why do the nations rage? and Why do they plot a vain thing? They're in rebellion against you. But even so, Lord, you love this world. We were enemies of yours too. But even though why, when we were yet enemies, you died for us. You came to us. You had a plan and you, you fulfilled that promise and you came in your love, Lord, to bring grace, the opportunity for favor with you and, and righteousness, Lord, with you at your expense. Would you just remind us of that, Lord? We are not to be fearful in that way uh, that we are now cursed by you. We're not, Lord. Because of your son, we're blessed by you. And we're in your family and, and now our home is in heaven. Remind us about this earth. It's perishing. Remind us not to love this earth, love this world or the things of this world. Because that's, that's to love the enemy. Uh, Lord, we love you and we, we love your promises and we want to be about your business. Give us the heart, as Peter said, Lord, to look and to say, well, what kind of people ought we to be? Uh, we, we're your people. So we should be yours, set apart to you, Lord. So would you remind us of that again tonight? We just want to say that we love you. You're awesome, you're great, and you're mighty. And we believe all the things that you said in your word, and they will come to pass. And they also change our hearts and change our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.